So I'm I'm Kyle Whitehead. Uh, this is my wife. I, I'm Kate Whitehead. And uh, we're going to be discussing kind of like our journey with the real estate side. Um, kind of picking up on one of our distressed properties that we currently own. And we are the distressed owner. Uh, so this property was our first deal. Um, and we'll get into the how long we've owned it um, in a couple minutes. But uh, since we purchased it, we've done several more deals. And we still have this one. So I'm going to discuss what it's, um, you know, the stumbles that we've made, the things we did right, and hopefully be able to keep somebody from making some of the mistakes that we made. Yeah, the things we did right were not very many on this particular property. Uh, this was at the beginning of our like real estate journey. So some of the statistics would be this property is in Kempner, Texas. Um, it was 802 days, I'm looking at my phone, from when I contacted with the seller to our projected offloading date. Which, which is would be approximately a two weeks. Yeah, it's now. approximately two weeks from now. We're currently under contract. So that was from the first time I communicated with the distressed seller. Now we are the distressed seller owning this thing. Um, the backstory of that property would be they had 47000 in back taxes. Uh, with the county and they were going to lose the property to auction it was delayed due to covid and then they were interested in selling because the foreclosures were coming back so we communicated 802 days ago practically uh, to start the process of purchasing the next one is 714 days it's been 714 days since we executed the purchase contract so it took as you can see from 802 to 714 that's like uh, about 90-ish days that we were communicating and negotiating the property and like answering questions. It took about 90 days. It's all of the communication with him was over text too. So he, yeah, that that um, you kind of text is a great way to make contact with a seller, but you try to get them on the phone as fast as possible because so much is lost in that. But in his case, that's all he would use for communication. Right. I tried to call a few times and it was poor reception at. Um, his location and then it was always like the text communications was coming in 11 o'clock at night my time in Arizona which would have been two hours ahead in, in central Texas so he's coming he's communicating with me at like one in the morning his time um, and my phone is designed to allow messages from my company number to come through with do not disturb on so I'd be pinged waking up in the morning for like the last, these 90 days and I'm like very hungry trying to close my deal. Um, and she kept telling me not to do it over and over again. So 714 days since executing the purchase contract. So that's where both sides, both sides have signed. The seller agreed to a price. At, we as the buyer agreed to a price. And that began the purchase process with the title company. The next statistic is 696 days from purchasing so um, we went on a contract in 714 days and then at 696 so that is about 18 days we closed on that property which is quite impressive looking back um, because during that time frame I was scrambling like I didn't know what I was doing scrambling it's a rural area and uh, it was also we were still dealing with the COVID because this is in um, late 2021 so still dealing with the COVID delays as well. Right. And then I needed to, because I'm not using my money. I'm not using my cash. So I'm using a hard money lender. So I had to communicate with a lender. I'm like, hey, I've got a property. Are you willing to give me um, a crap ton of money? And they're like, sure. As long as you pay us a higher amount of interest. And I was like, okay, deal. Because I kind of figured it'd be much easier because I don't know what I was doing. So. 696 days from when we purchased it. This is how long we've held a property. And we're talking, this is a hard money loan. Which means it's interest only payments. You have, so we, we have technically no equity at all in this house. Yeah, exactly. So you're buying it, you're getting a loan from a conglomerate of investors who are looking to invest their 401k money or their inheritance so they want a high return. So what they do is they pool their money resources together 
and they look for opportunities like the one that we found on where they allow us to use their funds so we could close quickly. It's called a cash buy, but it's not our cash that's buying it. It's these investors. So we are paying a premium in fees to buy, to use it, and we're paying a premium in interest. Um, it's a great deal if you are doing it correctly. Uh, so it goes from 696 days from purchase. Now we're looking at on market. So that took from 696 when we bought it, 409 is the next number. So you can already see that is close to um, 200 to 300 days of kind of waiting from purchase to actually putting it on the market. You had to do a significant rehab to the property, and then that also includes us getting the rehab set up, you know, getting the people in place to do that, um, at least. And that also meant and taking out another hard money loan as well, um, because I guess we'll get into it a little bit, but to make that happen, it meant we needed more cash. So Exactly. So 696 is when we bought it. 696 days ago, 409 days ago, we finally listed it. So Kate's the realtor. Um, she took her licensing and she passed the exam right before we were ready to list the property. So that was about, she got licensed in Texas close to 400 something days ago, mm -hmm. which is supposed to save us money because of the commission. So we put it on the market. That's 409 days ago, which is never a good thing when you're trying to sell an investment property. Um, we had many issues from it. So there's so many problems from the beginning that on days, days on market is a fully fixed up house. Like there's nothing wrong with it and it's ready to sell. So for it to sit for 409 days is a problem, like a huge red flag. Now we go into 34. That is our unique showings that Kate had to deal with while we were in Arizona. She was getting communications from all of these agents and wholesalers. Um, a wholesaler is a person who's looking at a property, buying it at a discount, and then offloading it to another buyer for the difference in purchase price. So as an example, they, they get it under contract. We agree at 500000 They find a different person to buy it instead of the wholesaler buying it. The new buyer will buy it at 550000 so the wholesaler will make the difference. Um, we sold it to the wholesaler for 500. They sold the contract or the right to purchase the property for 550. And that wholesaler will collect the difference for 50,000 or whatever the spread is. Um, so we had 34 unique showings between agents and wholesalers and stuff like that. And then we had go down to offers. How many offers did we get? We've had two offers um, that actually got to contract sent. Now, there was a few others that were like, oh, we'll send a contract, and for whatever reason, didn't happen. Um, we had an offer about four months ago, um, but that was contingent on that they had to sell another property, um, and ultimately, they were not able to sell. Um, so that meant we had to wait longer. So anyway, we're finally have the offer. We're past... Um, the point of like the it's called an option period in texas basically it's the inspection period um and right now we're waiting on the title companies um and the, you know to get all the paperwork done so that we can sign it and get it closed in about two weeks from now yep so we at we are down to two offers so out of 34 showings we had some of them to come back in multiple attempts to take a look at the property uh two offers were generated from that then we go down to the, the contract itself. It's 30 days under contract, which is not a problem. It's kind of standard uh, in the Texas area. This is concerning for us. Uh, we bought this property in 18 days using hard money, which is easy. This contract is 30 days. It's a VA loan. It's concerning to us because VA loans are very difficult and they're notorious for throwing things out of the air. Uh, as long as your foundation's fine, as long as there's not a termite problem or a pest inspection problem, as long as the roof is fine, typically it's going to be okay. So we are kind of waiting for that information. We've already had the inspection done. Mm -hmm. uh, we got the reports back. And then we, are, we have the appraisal complete. 
we are going to be waiting for that appraisal. The appraisal is designed to find out what the property is worth valued wise for the bank, which is what the VA loan is for. The appraisal is to, de to determine what the bank should be allowing this property to be purchased for. Uh, if the property is only worth 500 and the contract is for 550, the bank won't give 550. They will only lend out up to a certain amount for the equity difference so that the bank is protected in case the buyer defaults. So those are the, the high numbers. Now we're going to go into how this property was on market for 409 days. Do you want to start there? Do you want to start kind of how we, like, is that, you mean I was just start gonna, at the beginning? Yeah, I was going to continue with the statistics if you wanted to go somewhere else. That's fine. What other statistics do you have? Um, the re price reductions, the purchase okay, price. Okay, yeah, you can, yeah, go ahead. So, when we bought this property, we purchased it at $352,000 hard money. And that was in order to collect the property from the seller. Then we also got a second loan, a second hard money loan in order to do the renovations. Luckily for us, the company we were using or the investors we were using allowed us to 100% borrow. So that means that we didn't have to take any money out of pocket and put towards renovations. We just spent our cash to pay for closing costs and points and fees and there, everything. There was a couple of things we did have to pay for, like out of pocket that they wouldn't cover because they weren't on the initial estimate from our, like we have a general contractor and there was a couple of things that we wanted to add outside of that. Like there's no dishwasher in the house and I'm not going to, it's a 3000 square foot house. I, you need a dishwasher. So we paid for that. Um, and then there was only, it's a two story house. It's 3000 square feet. There's only one air conditioner. And so we added a second air conditioner to the house. So that was, you know, money we paid out of pocket as well. And that's, so that's another mistake that we will get to is making sure that your idea, your vision is covered in your contract bid so that you don't have to pay out of pocket other things. So we buy it for 352. It cost us about 155 in renovations. We went to put it on the market and we decided to get an appraisal. So it's the, the based on the property, we weren't quite experienced in what it should be listed for. So we decided to buy an, a, a professional opinion. Um, with this appraisal coming in, it came in at 936,000. So um, I asked Kate to list it for that appraisal mm -hmm. and she wanted to list it for significantly less yeah because in my head um it would get it closed faster um but i decided we would we would go ahead and try it and then that is the same week that the interest rates jumped like it was like a week after we listed the house that the interest rates skyrocketed right so in my head um we bought it for 350 plus 155. That's an easy 520 or so, or uh, for yeah, roughly 520, 515 or so. Then I was going to list it for 936, so that's like 400 thousand dollars in profit, minus commission and all that kind of stuff. So I was like, oh, that's not bad for my very first deal. Um, so that's why I wanted 936. And at 936. 409 days on market, we began to do price reductions. So it wasn't just the interest rates, it's also because of where we are in our market. We did a total of 16 price reductions. Um, do you remember the price reductions where we started? I mean, initially we were doing small ones. It would be like 10, 15. The biggest price reduction was probably the one really right in the middle, and we dropped it a hundred thousand. Um, and yeah, like they they were initially like oh five ten fifteen thousand, which is not an insignificant amount of money, but it can somebody that's looking for a property that their budget is you know let's say six fifty, they might look at properties that are six seventy five, but if we're right over that six seventy six, they're not going to see it. So. You know, the little numbers can make big differences. But yeah, we had a final price reduction 
actually right before we went under contract. It was the beginning of sep- it was the beginning of September and we went under contract at the end of September is when we did the final price reduction. Yeah, so these price reductions kind of started at those kind of values. And then I started playing games with it. Um, I was like, hey, put down seven 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 because I just you know, I was still gonna make a profit in my mind and all that kind of stuff. And then we were kind of doing random numbers in between just because we were in control over the number and I can tell my agent to do whatever I want because she's just sitting over there. <laughs> so we final price reduction went to um, list price of 550000 So we listed it at 936 which was the appraisal. And then we did our final price reduction at 550 Almost 12 months to the day. Exactly. From, like, yeah. It was just shy of a year. Yeah, she kept coming back and saying she needed to extend her agency agreement because she's a realtor. She has to get a signature from our company, which we are working on. You know, we have to approve the agent to sell. So she does the same thing as every other agent. And it's like kind of getting depressing now because you had to do it after six months. And then it's another one after a year. So we are looking at that now. Uh, we got it under contract after it was dropped to 550 on the market and the offer how did the offer come in um so it, it's a they they send in the offer after seeing the house like a couple days later and the initial offer that came in was for 500,000 and then they wanted us to then give them a what's called a concession or like a credit of $14,500. So really we're looking at, you know, 486 is their actual purchase price. So instead of signing that and then, or, you know, countering offer, like all of that, I got Kyle on the phone and with, and then I got the agent on the phone. So, you know, all of us chatted like, Hey, if you, if I sign this, we are, we are what's in a short sale situation, which means that we're selling for less than what we owe um, and then we will owe, meaning Kyle and I will owe the bank, or in this case, our hard money lenders, the difference. And so we're like, can, can we get a higher number? And ultimately, I mean, I've been telling the agent, we can't, at this number, you won't get a commission. So let's, let's see what we can do. So then Kyle went and got in contact with our lender and got um, like an estimated payoff statement. So, you know, some of the numbers we have are, are based on not quite what will actually end up being because we're going to close before the end of the month. But we got a payoff statement and I sent it over to that agent and it was basically if, if he wants to get paid as an agent, the, the closing price needs to be 550 because then his, his commission is two and a half. Mine's also two and a half, and then we have to pay the taxes and then all of the fees and all of that to the lender because we we didn't pay the payment up front for this month, so we've got to pay that plus a little bit of, you know, like a, a fine or whatever with an extra fee. Mm. Um, so, but with everything that lay, is laying out, um, it's going to end up being that we are actually probably going to be in a negative number anyway. However, it's going to be significantly lower than, you know, Sixty thousand dollars, like it would have been if we'd sent an initial contract. Yeah, so we're estimating about our profit would be negative twelve thousand dollars. And a lot of that is because the taxes in Texas are so high, um, and because it's a, oh. um, because it's a, not our primary residence, we don't get any kind of um, break on the taxes. So the taxes for this year. The other thing is that the taxes significantly jumped. When we bought the house, they basically were treating it, the county was treating it as if the house wasn't even finished. So it was taxed at like $200,000. And now the house is finished, so the tax appraised value is actually 549000 So the taxes are, by estimate, going to be about $9,000 for 2023, which puts our portion at probably roughly $8,000. So if, you know, in another market, that diff number may, would make a difference. And so that's a, the last number that I have for our statistics on this. Then the rest of the stuff, we'll kind of start discussing the problems that we are running into and like all of the failures that we jumped in. Uh, let's start at the top. August of 2020 or so. 2021. Is it 2021? 2021? Yeah. Um, 
communicating with the seller. I was kind of excited because I wanted to do real estate starting in January of 2020, I think it was, or December of 2019. Um, kind of my background was, I was like, I think I was trying to do some barbecue and I was doing some rub and I had YouTube videos on uh, just because I was like watching YouTube while I was doing the rub. And then the video switched over to uh, Robert Kiyosaki, who is the guy who got me inspired into real estate. His random video was talking about the difference between an entrepreneur, uh, a random worker, a business owner, and somebody else. I don't even know what the fourth one is. But then like I felt like a physiological change in my head on and I was like, okay, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I never read his books or anything, but it was phenomenal. So then I started looking more into Robert Kiyosaki, and then I found like Bigger Pockets, which I love Bigger Pockets at the beginning, where you could kind of have a community of a lot of investors. And I started talking to Kate about real estate. Yeah, and I mean, we'd always had kind of had interest in it, buying properties, <laughs> rentals, whatever. Um, but at the time, we still had a two year old at home. And so I'm like, well, you know, this could work. This is something I could do at home looked into it and then I, I got licensed with real estate in Arizona because you can do that online um, and I did that in January February is when I took the class and then March 7th I got took my licensing exam and passed and then of course you know it happened the week later in March of 2020 so then it kind of was not the best time to get into real estate so you know kind of learned what we could and then that first year um, we try to work on our business, but then I was also doing um, tr traditional real estate as a realtor as well. So, you know, we've had, I'd had some success with that, but we didn't have our, our first deal for the business. We'd had a few lead, you know, good leads come in, just nothing had closed. And so, and so here we are in August of 2021, so about 18 months in, whatever, into the journey. Um, I was like, this guy's like really excited. So the guy's like first offer to us was like he wanted to sell it for like six hundred thousand dollars, and I immediately said no. Like I, I, didn't, I had no photos of it. I just like no, we we're not doing that. So you know, Kyle nurtured that lead and got him to over those like two months again over text completely to um, I think it was three hundred fifty thousand. Um, and so I you know I agreed to it because it's like hey you know we. It, it's time we have some money in savings and like this this is potentially good a good deal um Kempner because no one knows where this is is about an hour north of Austin near Colleen <laughs> um, which is one of the largest military bases as it you know, has Fort Chavos um, so we we're like okay well, you know maybe we can get a retired somebody from the base to move out there um so, you know, we went into it thinking it was going to be a good deal. We also talked about, um, we talked to him potentially about us wholesaling it, but he was not interested in, uh, in us doing that. Um, yeah, because I told him, I was like, I'm not a buyer for, I think it was down to like 400 or something. Yeah. I'm like, I'm not, a, I'm not a buyer for 400 And he was like, well, I want to sell to you. What price to sell to me? And I'm like, well, what number do you want to, you know, give me so that I could possibly be a buyer? And he was like, how about 350? I was like, okay. Um, my exit strategy, which is the concept of how you would offload the property after you control it. My exit strategy was take a property that wasn't fixed up. I don't have the money. So I would just find somebody else, another buyer to sell it, um, fix it up and sell it themselves. The seller did not want us to wholesale at 350. So I was like, fine, I'm gonna switch it to a double close. And a double close is when I take a money from a lender or somebody who's willing to let me borrow their money for a small transaction period time frame. It's typically same day. So I would buy it for 350, I'd borrow the money, I'd pay um, like a 2% of the loan in fees which would have been close to like maybe 3,500 to $6,000 or so in fees. And closing, buying it for 350, using somebody else's money. Same day, because I've already found a different buyer for to buy it from me, 
they would buy it for. I'm kind of wholesaling, but it's a same day wholesale um, on where I control the property, the title goes into my company's name, and then I just turn around and I sell it to the next person because I've agreed to buy it and become the buyer. That's how I follow through on becoming the buyer, but I still can just sell it off in the same day. And my goal was to sell it for 450 or 500 because I was living in fantasy land on how somebody would be willing to buy that property that's completely unfinished. Yeah, I mean, this is, in, um, you can, anybody interested in this, that time period is when interest rates were super low and so houses were flying off the shelves, basically. So that, it was a fantastic time to really buy properties. You just gotta buy the right one. Um, so anyway, um, you know, the guy, we kept, made sure he understood you have, you know, he had $47,000 in back taxes. He's not actually getting $350,000. Um, and then, so the first thing was like, okay, send the contract. Well, the guy doesn't have a printer. So I had to overnight him a contract. And then, so I spent, you know, like a hundred dollars to do that. And then of course, this is in a rural area, UPS does not deliver on Saturdays so then it was a whole other thing and then after I sent it it was like I think after that is when we decided to do the lease back in the contract yeah so was, then it was like even it wasn't even worth it I like I wasted that hundred dollars even sending it yeah we wasted our money sending the contract because he he wanted to change the contract a little bit after we sent it so what the terms were it's as is means that we are not asking for any repairs and they can take whatever they want out of the property and leave the difference so we did not ask for anything on the contract he countered that he wanted to put specific things in here on how he wanted he said i want the stove the wood burning stove or whatever he put in specific things he wants a fridge out of his three or so and i'm like it's understood we've already agreed to you can take whatever you want you've already agreed that we're not asking for any concessions or any equipment but he wanted to be very specific in the contract um, of stuff and i was like okay fine so we would redo the contract with that verbiage and sent it out so this whole time you know we're asking for photos and he um he kept like sending sellers will send terrible photos I don't know what it is, but it'll be like a close-up of a corner of their living room and the close-up is blurry. Or it'll be like a picture of like their shower curtain. So we always know we're gonna get bad pictures. If anybody's trying to sell their house to an investor, we're, you know, I understand it can be embarrassing. Your home, there might be something going on, but the, it, the investor will give you a better number if they can get a better look at the house. So with that in mind, Kyle, um, since we're getting under contract, Kyle took it. I think he didn't take a day off because it was it was a holiday weekend. It was Veterans Weekend, so Kyle drove out there to actually physically inspect the property and get us some good photos so we knew what we were dealing with. Because the guy said that there was some unfinished project projects, and then he said that you know there was him and his um, wife had some health issues, so there was you know that ha- what that peak hadn't been great. So we knew it was gonna there's gonna be some issues going into it. Um, I don't, neither of us obviously realized how much the issues were going to be. So anyway, Kyle drove out there and met the couple and, um, I mean, we can kind of talk about that. I wasn't there. So, yeah, so it was about 13 hour drive and I did it, you know, in one stop because I'm trying to, I'm hungry, right? I'm very hungry. I wanted a deal. And in my mind, this was a deal. So let's start about these mistakes, right? A major one is going to be purchasing a property outside of your sphere. And typically the conventional wisdom is within a couple, like 20, 30 miles of where you live. For your first few deals. Like if, you know, once you have really gotten your feet wet, that doesn't matter. But in our case, it's close by, not rural. So that was a big one too, is yeah. not to buy in a place that there's not a lot of activity of investors buying and selling. So. And then not a big project. So we're talking a 13, um, 14 and a half acres with a 3,300 square foot house. Um, 
So very big, ambitious project for people that were not, yeah. had, hadn't been in real estate for very long. So if we were talking to ourselves right now, it would be don't buy it because it's not next to you. Don't buy it because it needs uh, about 150000 in renovations or more. Don't buy it because it's rural. Don't buy it because it doesn't have a lot of investors. So at the time, I was looking at properties, and they were selling for about $1.2, $1.5 million, kind of close to that range. Um, and then smaller properties were like $900,000, $800,000. And I was like, okay, I buy this thing for three fifty. I could sell it to an investor for six hundred or something, made up land, and they could put in sixty thousand dollars in renovations. Because I looked at the house and I was like, well, if I do based on square footage of three thousand square feet, uh, I was like twenty dollars a square foot, so it should be more than a hundred thousand dollars, one hundred twenty thousand dollars in renovations or whatever the number, one hundred eighty thousand, doesn't matter. The problem is I was wrong on everything. I was wrong on all of it. So, um, yeah, so we did the photos, got them back, and then um, something that I was really concerned about because we're closing at the end of the year is where are they going to go for the holidays? And so, you know, we had agreed on doing what's called a lease back where they could keep possession of the property for 30 days. And I kept pushing. That means that they are moving at the end of the year. We're talking like December 30th. Is that going to be okay? And they're like, oh, yeah, no, it's fine. So, you know, we put that in the contract, and we actually, instead of them paying us the rent, we actually rolled that into the purchase price. So our purchase price was actually $352,000 to account for their rent. Because we were going to rent it back to them or for $2,000 a month. And there was some pushback from them saying they didn't want to pay us to live in their own house, and I relented. I was like, fine, how about we bump it up to three fifty two? Because to me, I'm like, okay, Two thousand more dollars. It doesn't matter. I'll sell this thing and make six hundred, you know, yeah. six digits, in uh, in profit. So who cares? Three fifty two. So we were supposed to close on I think November thirtieth or something like that. And then the first, I am already struggling with the entire thing. I had some resentment and anger because I I just felt for some reason something was going to go wrong in this situation. So something we really had to work through it was a difficult time in our marriage because he thinks he's he's providing for a family and i'm i'm freaking out that this is a bad deal but the first major red flag was a couple days before closing they come to us and say that the their power is about to get turned off and they need 900 dollars for the power um we don't because they're going to be our tenants we don't want them to not have electricity obviously, because I can, you know, you have to have power. So um, they, instead of just giving them a check, Kyle actually, there was, um, the wife was a painter and she had an unfinished painting. So we bought the painting for $900 so they could pay the electric bill. We paid them directly. I have no idea if there actually was an electric bill problem. I have no idea. I'm going to assume that there was, but it could be, that's the risk that we took. And that particular item I'm not worried about ultimately, but it was a red flag that there's issues going on. So anyway, we close, um, the money gets wired like December 4th or something. And then they start texting after closing, Kyle asking him for help finding a property and talk about fantasy land. They wanted, um, like, I think it was minimum of an, of an acre within an hour of Austin for under $20,000. You can't even buy a parking space for that. And so that was, you know, I kept telling him that's not going to happen. I finally found in the entire state of Texas, I found one property. And that was in, like, on the border way south. It's just, anyway. So, again, red flags. Where are these people going to go? And they both have health problems, too. Um, so we finally get right before they're supposed to move out. And then they call Kyle and go, we didn't get our money until December 4th, so we're not going to move out until January 4th, which, first of all, our contract was for them moving out on December 30th. So, you know, another major red flag, but it's like, okay, fine. We'll give you a few more days. Um, January 4th rolls around, and they go, 
we didn't realize how hard it would be to find help to move over the holidays. You know, so again, more anger and resentment. I told you so. I told you so. I told you so. I wasn't listening. Yes. That like we should have pushed harder on that. Um, so then we get into, you know, they, they're not moving out. Um, we did agree to get, they paid us like $1,300 to stay like another week. But we told them, Kyle was kind of like, well, you know, it's rental income and the, the payment's coming up. It's great. And I'm like, I want them out now. Um, this house needs a lot of work. I want them out now. So anyway, I convinced Kyle after that second week, because again, they're not moving out. They asked for another extension. The money they're not paying is not covering our payments. So we told him, I'm sorry, it's, it's time for us to start the eviction process. Um, so back with the lease back, something that we did wrong there. Um, if we ever do one again, we will withhold a portion of the sale price until they move out. Um, we didn't know that at the time, and that could have saved us a lot of trouble because then they would they had no motivation to move out. They had their three hundred thousand um, dollars. There are the taxes are caught up. Like, there's no reason to move. And I mean, they love their house. So, so then we started the eviction process, which was two thousand um, dollars, which is very cheap because it's yeah. Texas. Yes, Texas so. is is a, a landlord friendly state at least. Um, so we got that process started, and then at the end of January, I get an electric bill in the mail for $400, which seemed high to me. So I'm like, hey, you know, maybe we should get somebody to go out there. So Kyle starts looking on, like, Facebook, Lampasas County or something, and puts out there, hey, we need somebody to, like, kind of look at this house. They, you know, the sellers have finally moved out. So he gets a guy, a random guy. Um, to go out there and the guy comes back, Hey, there's, there's, there's cats in the house and it's really, really hot in the house. There's no food, no water, um, other than like a poured out dog food, the cat food bag, whatever. But the, he said there's several animals. So and some of the doors are open and some of the doors are open and the heat's on really high. So we get the guy to, you know, turn the heat down a little bit and then, you know, secure the property. There is like a dog door, um, to it. But anyway, so he's like, I'm not even going to try to work on this house for you guys. Because his goal so, was to live in the home while he fixes it up. Because that's what I was looking for as a contractor. Um, kind of give me an idea of what's wrong. So he tells me there's like two or three cats there and it's super hot. So now I have to drive from where we are in, in southern Arizona out there to Kempner, which is another 13 hours. So I, and I'm like, okay, I'll just stay in the home while I get things fixed. I'll change the locks yeah, because the eviction's over. So I drive all the way out there and there's more than just three cats. There's like a total of six yeah, cats. Yeah, there's a total, and it kept, we had, animal control had to get involved. She, we thought it was four when we, when Kyle left and then she ended up trapping two more cats. Yeah. And these are semi-feral to begin with. Um, and they've been alone for two weeks. But and there's no food. There's no, yeah. And then I was there on the phone with Kate. I'm like, I can't sleep in this house because it's destroyed. It's destroyed. There's feces everywhere. They had three refrigerators that were unplugged and with full, full of, of produce, yeah. mostly. So the house, I, I'd never, I didn't go to it at that time, but I'm sure it did not smell pleasant. Yeah. And, um, um, and then there's raccoons coming in while I was on the phone with yeah, her. Yeah, raccoon just walked and into the back door. So I had to go get a hotel. Exactly. I go to a hotel and then I called um, Animal Control, which is part of the Sheriff's Department. And when I called Animal Control about cats, the, sh the sheriff called me and was like, hey, you can't be at the house. And I'm like, what do you mean I can't be at the house? He's like, well, you're under eviction, aren't you? And I'm like, right, but they're gone. And the sheriff was incorrectly at the time. I didn't know this. He was incorrect in saying that I couldn't do anything until the court system has completed its process. And we were still like two weeks away from the official court date being complete. So I called my lawyer and I'm like, hey, um, I have to leave now because I'm not going to be hanging around the house. I'm not going to be liable for changing laws at a house to secure it because my goal was to secure the home. Um, I can't do this while I'm here. Um, and the lawyer's like, hey, ignore the sheriff. He doesn't know what he's talking about. There is no eviction process because they had a contract to vacate 
they were served, then they vacated. End of story. So he's like, go back and change the locks. And I'm like, okay, I'm not going to change the locks, but I need to get these cats out. So I call Animal Control again, which is part of the Sheriff's Department. And I'm like, hey, y'all are incorrect on your information, uh, but I still need these cats. And the lady's like, I can't take the cats because that's the former owners. And I'm like, but they are, there's no food. Like, I don't really know what conversation I had, but that is where it got to the point where they came to abandoned animals. Yeah, and then she did, she did, they did manage to get in contact with the seller, and he claimed that none of those cats were his. That he had, he had three cats of his own and removed the cats from the property. Well, we have a photo. Of, one cat. Yeah, he had one cat, is what he said. Um, so we have photos from when Kyle went to visit the house and there is four cats in the photos and they're, they're not like hiding in the corners. They're like on the kitchen countertop. So even if he didn't think they were his cats, they were living in his home. So they were his cats. So, so luckily animal control came out to take care of that process. Uh, they were trapping them and trapping them. And like, every time I call the lady, I'm like, how's it going? She's like, I got two more, I got two more. Um, I picked up a cat or two. I don't remember how many I got. You only got one because the rest of them were too aggressive. You got one out yeah. and kind of let it run off on its own. So I went to HEB and I picked up these like cat carriers and I bought food for all these cats because um, I don't know, really know what they eat. And I was concerned about like, I didn't want to ruin their stomach because I didn't know how long they haven't had food. So I got some small food and I kind of put it in these little carriers and try to trap them myself. I eventually got one and then I had to, um, I was like, okay, I'll take you out to the field and I'll let you out with these horses and stuff like that. And then I just came home. So that was a huge other process. So to fix that, don't allow these sellers. And they also destroyed some of the parts of the well. They messed up the water. They messed up the, yeah. the rest of the house. And then ultimately the electric bill ended up being for that second half of $700. So, so it was like twelve hundred dollars for one month of electricity. Yeah. In Kempner, uh, it's an only electric system. So, that's it. The well is um, powered by electricity, so that wasn't a problem. The septic was reasonably okay, but everything was messed up. So the the lesson learned from the cat thing is understand that if it's abandoned animals, lead with that, because I went through a too many process of trying to figure out how to get rid of these cats. Also, the Sheriff's Department doesn't quite know everything about all the laws and all the process, and they don't know the contract I had with the seller. So that's why you defer to your lawyer. It's very good to have a lawyer. So that's another process is when you're buying, make sure that that purchase price in, is built in if I have to evict the $2,000 or whatever it costs. So that's another lesson learned. The cats are a lesson learned. Eviction, evicting your sellers is a lesson learned. Giving them money up front to mm -hmm. pay for their electric bill, not doing that is a lesson learned. Um, so many lessons learned. Yeah. And then now we move on to we control the property. So um, we got in contact with somebody that was interested in potentially partnering with us. So we got her to go out there and change the locks. And she's like, I'm going to get estimates for you. So... One of the people that she gets for the estimate, he wanted to buy the house himself. So he's like, I'll buy it for $300,000. Um, and, you know, we're like, no, we're not doing that. And then he kept kind of getting put off that she was like, I can't get an HVAC inspector out here. I can't get a septic. So here we are, you know, into mid-March, and we've already spent, you know, five, or actually I guess it was $3,000 at that point times two on the, the two first payments. So we're like, okay, you know what? We're not going to give her any more time. So Kyle gets on the phone and within a day gets all of the inspectors out there that he needs. Um, so then we look at the bids. So we kind of just told her we're not going to work with you. Then we look at the bids that we got um, for repairs. And um, we went with a with a general contracting company. Um, and it's like, okay, then it's how do we pay for this? And then when can they start? So it ultimately ended up being that, you know, we went with a hard, another hard money loan for uh, 150000 Um, And then we kind of broke ground on the project in late or late May was the, the time frame. The first thing that had to be done was the road into the property was so washed out that we had to spend $20,000 to just make it drivable for big trucks. 
Um, so again, that's something that a, a buyer is not going to care about. Like we can't be like, well, we've spent $20,000 on road improvement. It wasn't to like make it like a gold plated road. It's to make it just so a truck can drive down it. Dirt. Um, so that was the number one. And then it was, um, do you remember how many tons of trash that they took out? Do you remember? I don't remember the tonnage, but this is in the same time frame where the first guy I asked to go take a look at the property and found these cats. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. So Kyle is is telling me that he hired this guy off of Facebook. And I'm like, what's this guy's name? So he tells me. And the first red flag I saw with that is that his profile picture is him, like, shirtless staring in a mirror. Um, and this is, like, not a teenage boy. It's a, it's a grown man doing that. So I'm like, that's this what is, she noticed first. Uh, that's what I noticed first. I'm like, this is, like, from MySpace in 2008. <laughs> what are, What is happening? So then I Google his his name. And the first thing that pops up is that a most wanted for a nearby county because he keeps um, skipping out. Like, he, 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 like, escaped cop cars. Like, there's drone footage of him running from cops. And I'm like, great, this guy has access to our property. So, yeah, I for, kind of <laughs> forgot about that. So, one morning in, like, mid-April, we get a phone call, and it's the sheriff's department again, and she's like... This is after we evicted the cats. This is after, after we yes, evicted the after sellers. that, they're like... <laughs> Um, did, you know, did, did someone have permission to be on your property? Because in the middle of the night last night, the, um, <clears throat> the neighbors called and said there was somebody on the property and she, it had happened like two nights in a row. Anyway, so the guy abandoned his girl and it ultimately ended up being the same guy and he abandoned his girlfriend. She got arrested and they were like still looking for him. I don't know if they've ever caught him or not, but yeah, the, so we were yeah. like, we don't care. And he's picking up trash, but they wanted us to press charges to make, you know, to make their job easier. So, yeah. So he was like removing stuff from the property, but at this point it's only garbage that I was planning on hauling off anyways. Yeah. So I told the lady, I was like, um, is this, you know, is this the name? And I was confirming that it was him. And I was like, okay, I don't care. I hired him before go out there. Um, at this time I, I did know that he was a wanted person cause she told me when I was doing my first drive out there with these cats, but I was like, I don't really care. Like if he's taking trash, that's fine. And she's like, okay, whatever. And she hangs up, but then she calls me back and she's like, Hey, um, so we can't find him, but we have his girlfriend. I'm like, okay, like, is that a problem? And she's like, well, we're having a hard time keeping him. And, um, we, we want to make sure that he's not going to be doing this anymore. And I'm like, are you, do you want me to press charges? And she was like, that would be helpful. And I was like, okay. So I just yelled, I pressed charges. Yeah. And then I was like, I don't want to deal with this anymore. So then I texted him. I'm like, Hey man. The cops were looking for you. Again. She claimed that they had acts like we had per, they had permission to be at the property was what it was. So we wanted to confirm with him that yeah, that, yeah, that he had did not have permission to be on our property. So I texted him, and I was like, "Dude, the cops are looking for you. You got to turn yourself in, and you no longer have access to my property. Like you just don't have permission." And I was like, "Dude, your girlfriend, just go take care of your girlfriend." And then I did it on Facebook too, mm -hmm. and like a couple months later, he kind of resurfaces, apologizing and all that other stuff. But I don't know what happened after that. So now yeah. we had like a, a felon, we had yeah, evictions, so, we had so animals. That's, yeah, that's the next thing. So is, lesson learned. Let Google your, them. Like, yes. Go, spend the 30 <laughs> seconds Googling their name and go from there. Um, yeah. So yeah. So then we're into, you know, the actual construction process. I think the ultimate amount of trash in that we were moving, I want to say it was like seven truckloads. Yeah. Like big truckloads. And we're talking dumpsters, like, like full dumpsters. Yeah of trash that um, had to be removed from around not just the house but around the property and we're, we're talking like abandoned cars and because they were they had a lot of projects that they were going to finish and of mm -hmm. course never did um so yeah then we started the rehab from there and this is a lesson learned on the rehab with the money know what you're looking for we had an idea it was like oh yeah great a remodel and we told the contractor we wanted to look great but we didn't really have yeah. anything specific. So that's that's horrible well, with and the then, contractor. So there's a communication problem on our part. But then also within the contractor's company, they were not communicating with each other. So the guy that started the project with us, he told me that any major finishing decisions, they would come to me first. And then, you know, we're getting photos of the process. This is the one thing we actually did right is that we didn't 
you never ever release all of the money up front to contractors. So we're doing draws. They only got paid when a job was complete. And then verification. So, and verification. But the problem was, is I start getting photos of like tile, you know, put up. I'm like, I didn't pick that. So I'm, you know, I get on the phone with them. They're like, oh, well, you know, like we thought it was like approved. I'm like, no, I, I didn't pick this. I didn't pick that. Um, I was like, okay, but fine. It's already been done. I'm not going to worry about it. So the only thing that I actually got to pick where I got to pick paint colors and I got to pick the, the kitchen countertops, everything else that they finished, I did not get to pick. And a lot of it is stuff I would never have picked, especially because this is a high end luxury home. And some of the finishes they went with are not high end luxury. I actually, like I guess I did make them change that. I made them change a bathroom countertop. I kind of threw a fit about the bathroom countertop because it was like the cheapest Home Depot one and it didn't even match anything. So yeah, I, I did make them change that, but the rest of the tile, I just kind of let it go. Um, but that was a miscommunication in their company because the contractor was telling everybody else, yeah, sure, this is fine. And not telling them that, no, I actually wanted to be involved because they're used to investors doing fix and flips really fast and just having like kind of a standard look for all of their projects. So there was a miscommunication there. So it's something we, you know, I think we resolved, Mm. but you know, we're into like late July and they're supposed to be done at the end of July. So, um, that's when we started realizing there was a problem with the contractor and the communication because the guy we were working with got fired. Um, so we scheduled to drive out because yeah. it's supposed to be done. And that's kind of, we go out there and as we're showing up, it's so not. So we got out there, it's actually it was the first week of school. So I was upset our kids are missing the first week of school. But I was like, you know what? It's amazing. We'll see this finished house. Um, so we get out there and the house is not done. That's her first impression of it. Yeah. House. And she's never been to the house before. So I've never been there. Project's not done. There's finishes I would never, ever have chosen. Um, the contractor I was working with is not there. So somebody else and, and you know, it's actually one of the owners of the company. And he's like, we had no idea what you guys were being told. And I'm sorry. But it ended up being basically another 30 days worth of work had to be completed before the house was ready. Um, things that needed to be taken care of is the, um, the seller had put in tile countertops and for like one side of it and there was cat urine that could not we actually paid and yeah, we paid like nine hundred dollars to have a professional cleaner come out she couldn't get the smell out so we had to rip that out and out of our pocket because it wasn't included in the bid pay for a countertop to be put back there um and then there was like they didn't paint some stuff that should have been painted and i mean yeah i had a full-on meltdown like because we also scheduled our crying. photographer. Yeah, we, we, and again, we paid for the photographer. She's coming from another area. So then we had to pay. We paid her. She she would, would have done it, not worried about it, but we paid her for her time for coming out there. Um, we, we came out there because we assumed it was done. We were told it was done. So we drive out there. Or just we like scheduled. a couple of what's called a punch list items, which is like when you tape off that they missed a spot for paint, not that the entire staircase is not painted. So we scheduled the photographer to meet us there. And it was awful. It was just everything was not done. We even had to get cleaners out there to redo it. And yeah, and they claimed that our yeah they, they claimed they'd been cleaning it anyway. So had a full on sobbing, crying meltdown over the fact that we've spent all this money and we're still not there. I I thought I saw the light at the end of the tunnel, and that wasn't that was like still the entrance of the tunnel. Like we entered another tunnel. For me, I was like excited. Look, this looks so different and most of the smell is gone compared to how I saw it. And then this is her first impression of a property she's never stepped foot in and she's handling all of the remodel remotely. And so that was crazy. So then we finally get it, um, it's done. Then we get it the appraisal and then, you know, that's the story of going on market. Um, yeah. And that's kind of like the story of Kempner in a nutshell. There's a lot of nuances to it for other other lessons we learned, but that's a lot of lessons in one. And we're still dealing with those problems. So, you know, we're losing $12,000 roughly in profit on the sale. Does not include the sunk costs of holding that money for almost two years in hard money. So we are probably a hundred and twenty thousand yeah. dollars. We have, we'll do the math in when cash is said gone. And done. So that's like another thing is like I was on board with like, hey, you know what? It's a problem. If I make a mistake, whatever. 
and she's from the mindset of like save 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 literally everything because that's like how you progress in life and that's how you stay safe yeah. and for me i'm like oh i got this new mind idea um risk is fine and then i just blew it like yeah. i literally blew all of our money on that property I mean, and that also includes last year we made about $90,000 on other deals and we yeah. have zero of those dollars. All of that went into that property. Yeah. Um, and that's, I mean, it's also delayed us being able to do more because it's like, well, I got to make these payments. Um, so, and, you know, some of it ended up being a mindset thing. Obviously, I, you know, I, it, there was some depression in there too where I wasn't trying to find other deals and things like that. So, you know, um, I think, you know, ultimately we we had the lessons and we've learned them, and we just don't want anybody else to make those same mistakes that we did. Yeah, it's about one hundred twenty thousand dollars in lessons, but the good thing is, is that we can move on, um, mm -hmm. even if it doesn't close. So this is where we didn't really cover on the Kempner side is like we just you know it's so much money sunk that we will never be able to get it back, and that was depressing. But now we're kind of be like, okay, we're coming out of it. We can now focus on what does make money and we've learned so much that everything we've done since has been significant profit on yeah. a separate flip we we bought another house and completed the project we've gotten other deals but those are for another day that is our Kempner story and we have we'll probably refer back to that in the future because that is such a strong um, anchor point in our minds it's very vivid and it's very costly so so many lessons learned but i appreciate yeah. uh hopefully y'all learned something hopefully you can actually take action on that well thanks well, thank you